Yep. Uh, so anyway, this is the first picture I have of anything ham related. So I'm just going to leave it up there for just a minute. I thought it might be, you might be interested to find out how I uh, got into radio and stuff. Um, <laughs> it came down. I, 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 I'm yeah. surprised that you were, you were in Farmington. That's where I grew up. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I remember um, in, in grade school, uh, listening to nighttime AM radio, being fascinated by Skip. And then uh, I remember around the ninth grade, maybe, there was a book I took out of the school library and it was called um, SOS at Midnight. Have any of you, uh, yeah. did you, any, did you yeah. any of you read that? No. Yes. Uh, I think it was written by a K-6 and it was some, you know, mystery thing related to uh, radio for boys. But that made me realize that it, it was possible for an ordinary person to transmit, not just listen. So that stayed in the back of my mind. That book stayed in the back of my mind for quite a while. And... Uh, in junior high school, there were a couple other guys that were uh, interested in getting a license. There was a, one of the teachers was trying to form a little club there, so got a novice license in 64. And shortly after that, this, was, this is my folks house right here. Um, I had a vertical at first on the roof. Uh, I, had, I got my general pretty quick. Um, uh, but people were telling me that I wasn't getting out good because it's a vertical that, you know, radiates equally poorly in all directions and all that. So I figured I needed an inverted V. If you look back toward the back of the house, there's a 50 foot pole there that my dad welded together. Um, and it folded over with a pulley and a tree behind it. I think we used a hand crank at the tent, hand winch at the time. And it would fold down toward where the base of that Rowan, uh, that uh, Spalding Tower is there. And uh, that went up a couple times, up and down a couple times after wires broke and whatnot. So uh, it's, it's, I wanted to be able to get out better in contests. So I uh, convinced my dad to uh, let me put up 48 feet of this Spalding Tower and a two element quad. And he built, you know, he was a welder, so he, he uh, welded a uh, tilt over base there. We used the same pulley in the tree. Where's my mouse? Oh, there it is. Uh, back here. And uh, put that up. It worked great. I figured if a two element quad at uh, 48 feet worked good, a four element quad at 70 feet would work even better. So without even considering whether you could extend this tower like I ended up doing, I did it bought some straight sections to fit between the tapered sections on these and got, so this is a 72 foot tower right there. I don't know if you've read my uh, little yeah. herb there. <laughs> so I'm not going to read everything I wrote. There's a couple of pages that, that are basically for excuses. You know, you got to have some excuse pages. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so that thing came crashing down. We put it back up and it worked great. And right around that time, I don't know, maybe 68 or something, uh, Bob, uh, Kate, HLR, uh, and I got together and started thinking about putting up a bigger station. I think he was a little more gung-ho about it than me at first, because I didn't think my folks would uh, let us do anything like oh, that. I was, was gung-ho because I didn't have much of a station. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, you had all this land and, and a big tower already. Well... As I mentioned on a later page, that lot actually was only a, an acre and a half, and it was all wooded, so I'm kind of amazed yeah. we ever did what we did there. Yeah. Um, so here's the, um, the second addition to the station. We thought that um, naturally the very next thing to do would be to put up 120 feet of Rhone 45 and a 40-meter quad and all that. It uh, only made sense. Uh, Guys but, and trees. <laughs> <laughs> guide the trees yeah and uh but it wasn't too long before we were repairing the quad because that's oh, what God, you do that. <laughs> um, that's right i was i was going to uh, try to correct the color on this photo a little bit it kind of has an eerie look to it but decided that uh it was fine that way and uh <laughs> Then we had some kind of an ice storm. Did we have an ice storm, Bob? Or, we, we, we had an ice storm followed by a pretty good wind storm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, 
Uh, it was sad. It was very sad. Do yeah, you remember, if, was that a two inch boom or a three inch boom? That was, was a three inch. Okay, because that's, that's the one you had. I don't know who welded the iron cross we used to call it. It was uh, two channels back to back. Yeah, but that looked like looked like it should have held it pretty good because um, well, something happened. <laughs> it, it was it was guiding the boom uh, in in the horizontal plane and the vertical. Anyway, that's what happens to quads. Anyway, <laughs> one way or another. You used a lot of irrigation tubing back then, and maybe maybe that still do started. actually. Okay. So this was basically the last uh, configuration of the Stockton station. And it's taken from the east. This, uh, that's the 72 foot tower right over there, but it's further from the camera than this one. So that's why it's buried in the trees there. Although the trees were 70, 80 feet tall. Big so. trees, yeah. 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 Nice. Uh, this uh, 140 feet of Rhone 25 went up with no, no way to guy it properly. <laughs> Uh, it was a disaster waiting to happen, but then the disaster did happen. Um, it was a small tornado or something that came through. I came out the next day and I uh, couldn't even see the tower. The top 40 feet was laying over in my neighbor's yard, crumbled up <laughs> aluminum over there. And that was about it. Uh, you know, I was, I was ready to get out of the house anyway. <laughs> and my dad's insurance company said, uh, He's got to go. He didn't. They didn't say he's got to go, but they said no more towers. I, I I got a funny story about the two element forty there. First of all, Steve had to build that whole thing up top. Yeah. Um, wow. There's there was no way to to build that thing anywhere in the trees, so it went up piece by piece. But even more than that, uh, one of the DX contests had started at the same time he was final. He was doing. Steve was doing the final coax dressing of the tower, and he was still at the top. And he just yelled, yeah, go ahead. And, and we did. And it yeah. worked well. It didn't work anywhere near as good as the quad, but it worked okay. It was good enough to yeah. hold a frequency on 40. And, you know, it's basically what you need to do. And uh, here, I, there's only, I think, three photos of operators here. I don't know who that young guy is there. Um, Can't see his mustache. I don't know who this guy is either, but uh. that's a hair. <laughs> it was three, yeah, I know there. that was before even a trace of a bald spot back there. But I was only <laughs> twenty, early twenties, you know. And uh, but Jim Hebert, um, we, I think we find uh, Bob and I finally decided that was Fred Lass uh, uh, WB two OEU's signal one. But Bob remembers Jim begging his uh, dad for. Uh, for one of those, and I think I he got it. Yeah, I do. His dad was W eight SS. Uh, oh, and uh, wow. I don't, I don't know what he did. Uh, I don't know how what he did in ham radio, but nice guy though. Oh yeah, I, I he was. Uh, I was a member of the Ford Tin Lizzie Club, and uh -huh. uh, Ken Stecker was there. He was the yes. uh, distinguished gentleman. I mean, no, no oh, other what was what was Ken's call? Oh wait. Uh, Ken's was W8SS, wasn't it? Uh, W8VRB, yeah. I think uh, uh, Jim's dad was. Yeah, okay, I got that mixed up. Yeah, but. okay. Uh, so that was it on Stockton. Um, now, right around the time that the Stockton station was um, ending, uh, NADA found this house on Halstead Road, right next to the railroad tracks. And... Uh, he had been li he and Grace had been living in Detroit, and he had a couple wire antennas there. But he'd also operated a few contests from our Stockton station, and I guess he just wanted to have some decent antennas. So he was looking around for a place and found this one. He and Grace moved in. Um, as I say in my little blurb here, uh, he all of a sudden let it be known that we could put up some towers there. So we did. And I believe that this was the configuration when he moved out and we moved in, which was in 77, actually. Uh, I have 76 here, but no matter. Uh, Miriam and I got married in 76, so it must have been 77. But once we moved in, uh, we kept putting towers up. And uh, this was the final antenna configuration Whoa. on Halstead. Wow. So, in other words, we moved in. Well, Joe moved in in, in 72. We moved in in 
77 and kind of went to town. And this was at the end of 81. And uh, we moved out in 82. But it was a pretty, pretty damn good station, although it had some issues. But this was the uh, four element 15 meter quad, which I think came from Lee. Yeah. That was yours, right, Lee? Yes. And where did that Rhone 25 come from? I know it's this tower started out at about 50 or 60 feet and ended up at about 100 or something. I, I started buying sections to keep adding to it. Uh huh. And uh, I think uh, we figured out that 110 feet of it was uh, my tower. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then this. This was 120 feet of Rhone 45. It probably was the tower that came from Stockton, although we had a lot of Rhone 45 at one point. I was buying it used from Joe Keller, W8WW. He always had stuff to sell, and we, we he always seemed to have the right stuff, so we bought a lot of it. But uh, So that was 120 feet of Rhone 45, uh, four over four, and I thought this was kind of a neat, swing gate mount right down here it was just a bent piece of two inch pipe uh, that went through a collar saved a lot of uh, work I think Kevin Drost got that thing bent at his dad's shop or something like that uh, these antennas here started out as Cushcraft CB uh, Yaggies as I recall we tuned them for 10 yep. and uh, those antennas uh, appear at the Coomer Road station later on not as an H frame but they moved along. Wow. This is a six element 10 fixed on South America. Uh, and I think there was a four element Cushcraft 15 on that windmill tower back there. In this picture, that's the six element 10 yeah. that uh, now is, is right there. But uh, I think we had a fixed South American on 15 and we had the three element that tower started at 120, ended up at 190. Uh, during the Halstead days, I bought a uh, Telrex medium-sized uh, chain-driven rotator. That's what's turning that three element right there. And that's still up on the Roan 80 right now here. We had also acquired somehow a W0 MLY prop pitch, which is turning that top 20. Mm -hmm. yeah. And... Uh, we never had a whole lot on the low bands. I forget what we had here. Like wires, Steve. Just, yeah, yeah, just wires, I know. Yeah. Now, did you have a, a four sloper system on, on 80? Yeah, we had. Uh, you know, four slopers and you, you, you switch around? Yeah, with no real phasing, you just picked out one, right? Right. That's right. probably it, what we had. The other had. ones are supposed to be parasitics. Yeah. Right. Uh, couple of pictures here. That's the three element 40 after we uh, added the third element, replaced some hardware. That's uh, Joe and Al W uh, 8 L ALP now. And uh, that's where we're trying to figure out how to get it up there. Don't you usually wait for snow? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that was the uh, shot from about 60 feet um, on the 40 meter tower. And uh, we had two trains a day go by there, 120 kV lines that ran along the railroad tracks that were pretty quiet usually. Uh, they would give a little corona during uh, foggy weather. Main problem uh, with noise at this site was various sources of line noise. I could quite often be found uh, walking along the road with uh, with an antenna and uh, radio and all that crap. I, one of the neighbors asked me uh, very firmly to get off of his property one time. Uh, but anyway, yeah, that- did, uh, did you carry a sledgehammer with you too? Oh yeah, oh yeah. And we would bang on guy wires on the poles and all that. But <laughs> my brother-in-law, my brother -in -law, Terry, uh, W8TR now, uh, worked for the power company at the time, and he, uh, he, I think he developed the noise finding techniques that they used, and gave me the name of a couple people that worked there in that department, and I had their home numbers, and uh, if I actually found the pole, they would come and fix it, but if I was not sure, they would, 
wouldn't even bother because it was taking up too much of their time, you know. So uh, I got good at finding the pole. Some pictures of operators at Halstead. You know this guy. Yep. Uh, there's Bob. Now, whose S line was this? I had I had an S line. Uh, I had two at one time. I what year is this again? You know, Bob. I think that's yours because it had the uh, multiple crystal packs. Yeah, you know, you're I, right. That's yeah, right. Good, good observation. I used to take mine out there, but mine was a 75 S three B and a 32 yeah. three. I, I'd run 40 with an S line and a spare receiver. It was just back in the day where you, you had to go below 7,100 and, and uh, listen. Did, did the spare, could you switch to the spare receiver to uh, swap frequencies or no? Um, not easily. It's not like the radios that, of today. <laughs> we had that set up on one of the, uh, at least a couple of the Drake lines, I think. Lenny was rem remembering me that he had made a little switch box for it. It worked real good too. Yeah. Yeah, on the 20 meter station, there was a switch where you could slave the uh, transmitter to, to left or right receiver. Yes. And that was kind of, um, I don't know if it was advanced for the day, but it was definitely what you needed if you wanted to have a second guy sitting there. Uh, it, it was you know. pretty slick. It worked yeah. well. Yeah. What's this, uh, what's this right here? I don't remember. Oh, Rotor control? No. Amplifier. Oh, it's an amp. Kind of small amp. I, can I don't remember ever having an amp right there, but this tune and load. That was the driver, Steve. Uh. <laughs> Good lord. <laughs> Mark Davish. Yeah. Rest in peace. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um by the way, you know, one thing that I never uh, never came over to Coomer was all the time meter clocks we had. I have no idea what happened to those. Yeah. I threw mine away, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happened to a lot of them. Uh, there's the one of the 20 meter teams. I forget oh. who those guys are. Amico <laughs> preamp. I like that. <laughs> uh, that was, uh, I'll tell you, when... Every, when you guys were there, I think you operated there twice or maybe once and just you, Greg, another time. I don't remember. but I was uh, there three or four times. Oh, were you really? It was, oh, it was yeah. great. Our score always got bumped up quite a bit. Uh, Bill Simpson. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. Usually operated 10 meters, uh, 10 meter CW, but he was happy to do anything. He was taking care of our QSLing and... Uh, just about anything. He Lee, would... Lee's neighbor in Royal Oak. Yeah, that's right. Yes. That's right. Yeah. Yep. And uh, I think he passed away. What Lee? About six, seven years ago, or something. Uh, maybe about ten. Ten, ten years. Ten. Yeah, I can ten believe long it. Life. Yeah. Lee, what was the story with Bob? It, 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 with with Bill? He did. He never ran more than a hundred watts, did he? Oh yeah, he had an eight thirteen amplifier running five hundred watts. Five hundred. Okay. Yeah. But his antenna wasn't very high. No, fifty feet. Yeah, and he was at, he was on top of the honor roll, wasn't he? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Wow. He was a DXer. Yeah, he, he, he was. was legendary. Yeah. Uh, Jerry Selman, rest in peace. Yeah. And, uh, My old neighbor for a while. Yeah. Oh, great. I used to uh, when he moved over onto get the name of that street there in Beverly Hills or whatever. I went there a few times and yeah. worked on his tower. And on, Jerry, no uh, call now. Kevin, is he Kevin out of ham radio completely? Or? Well, yeah, I guess so. I mean, unless he's bootlegging someplace, but uh, he, doesn't, <laughs> gotcha. he doesn't have a call the last time I checked. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Don't know what he's doing. A couple of group photos. Um, I always get a have to laugh at uh, Pat's hairdo on this one. <laughs> <laughs> of course, m mine wasn't <laughs> all that great either. <laughs> um, oh, there I am! My God, there you are, man. <laughs> How did I get it? <laughs> You're right. In the dungeon. Oh, oh my God! Hey, Steve. Uh, Chris Peters there. Yeah. He used to be my neighbor when I was a kid. 
Oh, in Flint? In Flint, yep. Is that right? Yep. Huh. And I went to school with his sister. He was a few years older than us. But, yep. I think his, his station was the first ham station I ever saw. I think I ran into him on 80 meters, and we chatted a few times, and I went up to his house a couple times just to see what, what he had there. And then he'd come down and operate our station in ways that I wasn't real fond of. But um... So I heard. <laughs> where, where was this? Where? where uh, Steve, uh, the, the, the dungeon. Oh, this was on the ha Halstead house. It's uh, Halstead between Pontiac Trail and um, Walnut Lake Road. That's interesting. About, yeah. about I, halfway I between. I do not remember that, but there, there I am. I remember the shoes I had on. But... <laughs> <laughs> you, you were a handsome dude then. I got to tell you, you, yeah. you looked, uh, you, you know. I, <laughs> I, I couldn't believe when I found out your age, though, because you must I, I have been. Hair. You were ten years older than we most of us were yeah, at that I, time. Uh, I turn know. eighty. I turn eighty next week, Steve. Wow, wow. That's my A four and also my T four X. That's uh, an A three, isn't it? It's an A four. Is it? Yeah, that's my A four. Okay. Still have it. Yeah. You still have it, Lee. I know I sold it to Dan Redman, Kate Dr. in uh, Tol uh, in Ohio. He uh, he bought it about fifteen years ago, ten fifteen years. That was a Jerry uh, Selman. So, yeah, yeah. They, I, I had one of those too. They were great. Yeah. Yeah, he would put like mechanical filters in and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, low right? noise mixers and the whole shot. Yeah. Steve, what year was that? Do you know? Well, it was sometime between um, I would say '78 and '80. Uh, well, I was in Minneapolis in '77. And and didn't and so it wouldn't have been after '77. No, it had to be before '77. Oh. Yeah, that's probably right, because I think later on when we got going a little better, uh, I don't think we ever had a station down there in the basement. That was kind of short-lived. I was living in Bloomfield Hills then. Yes. So I wouldn't have been too far from him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hey, Steve. Yeah. Did, uh, did Jerry used to build stuff over there at Elmas where he worked? Yeah. Oh, he'd do this, he'd do this in his basement. Yeah. Yeah, he he basically just did repair work on um, audio stuff there. Although he, there was probably occasionally a hammer again there. Yeah, he right. He used on. to he used to build some pretty big amps. Yeah, he did. Did. Yeah, the only guy that uh, you had in there was um, um, what was it? A K and M. Oh, I've lost it now. Um, Mark Dabish there. Yeah. He used, to, yeah. he used to work with me over at Bendix. Oh, okay. is that right? Yeah, but he was a big VHFer though. He he did yeah. more stuff on VHF, I think, than he did on HF. Yeah. He uh when he operated with us, he usually operated eighty or one sixty. But then not long after that, uh well not long after we stopped seeing him, he was strictly VHF. He gave up on the low bands. Right. Yeah, um, I probably took that picture, Steve, because I'm not in it. Ah. Yeah. Well, there yeah. you go. Yeah. All right. So that's the end of my pictures from Halstead. And uh, we get into the Coomer uh, Road phase here. Um, I'm not going to read this, but. I guess uh, this is being recorded if anybody wants it. So, uh, oh, one thing I might I want to wanted to mention: we had the coolest device in '88. One of our operators, uh, W or uh, Kate LV, a uh, friend of uh, Lee's, uh, electronics genius. He's like a PhD in physics and stuff, and made all kinds of uh, stuff from scratch for the car companies. And but anyway, he made this. He and I worked on the uh, user interface for this, and then he built it and did it all with machine code. It was a CompuCare. I wish I had uh, gotten a picture of it to put in here. Is that Eric? Uh, Eric, Eric, yeah, yes. Eric, yeah. And, uh, 
and Lee, Lee, you used this thing too, right? Yeah, I did. Uh -huh. Yeah. It was you had to you had to send good code, but it would you would hold certain buttons down, and you had a paddle hooked up, and it had a little LCD display, and um, while you were sending the other guy's call, you'd hold the other guy's call button down, and you'd have to send his call correctly. But it was very easy to make corrections, and uh, when he when you're uh, receiving a a report or an exchange, you would type that in on the little pad he had built right into it, but everything else would come in via the paddle. You could hook a keyboard up to it if you wanted, but right. the first, the first, uh, or the, the two contests that we operated in 88, we used that. So 88 is the very first year that I have logs on computer. Um, uh. I did not have a PC at the time. I knew they were coming, but I didn't have one. And, uh, but as soon as CT came out, that's everything changed. But I'll have to send out a picture of that thing. It was uh, really cool. He also had a matching voice keyer for it too, uh, for phone contests. Where, where is Eric now? He's in uh, Fenton off of Fish Lake Road. Oh, okay. W8IRO? Yep. I remember him from the Detroit Amateur Radio Club. He used to meet in Highland Park. We yep. I think he was about 13 years old. Uh huh. I think Lee brought him over to the um, Halstead house a couple times, and uh, he. Uh, yeah, he and I uh, were operating 40 meters a lot together, and that kind of got him introduced to your station and to you and all that stuff. To how we weren't afraid to put up shit, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so let me see now. We didn't really get on the air using computers till about 91. And then we were pretty regular through the 90s. Toward the end of the 90s, this was the antenna configuration. Um, the three element 40 was on the 190 feet of Rhone 45. Had a two high stack on 20, three high stack on 10 and a two high stack on 15. And then back here, that little tower back there had a three element 20, which I didn't, I, I, for the life of me, I can't remember ever having a three element 20 back there, but in another picture, you'll see it's definitely a three element. So, and then there was a, a, a four element 15 on another 40 foot tower in behind these uh, trees here. And there were there were some wires on this tower, so that was that was it toward the end of the '90s. Um, oh yeah, here's the two little towers, four element fifteen, and a three element twenty. God, I don't remember that. <laughs> and then uh, the, these coaxes you see coming off of this tower, the ones coming from this relay box were the. 160s. We had three sloping dipoles, and then the one coming off this relay box was 80. We had four sloping dipoles off there. Uh, here's a little tramming adventure. I think the 20 meter tower was uh, had already been raised to 150 feet from 120. Must have been a real hot day because it's a rare thing for me to have shorts on. And uh, so this was my first, this was the, how we did tramming at first. It's, it's gotten now, if we do it, I don't need to put these little outriggers on here. I use um, slings that are kind of in a V formation, one for the load line and one for the tram line. But the idea is the same. Uh, because we weren't at the boom to mast clamp with the, uh, with the tillers, uh, the antenna is a little, unbalanced but once it found its uh, equilibrium there it went up just fine it was no trouble it works great pulling it with my tractor and creeper gear i was not mowing any grass at the same time i was not trying to dual uh, <laughs> dual purpose there <laughs> but i could have <laughs> uh birds oh my god oh wow and uh the ones I like to watch are the hawks and owls. They like to get right on the top of the tower and hunt up there. They just sit up there. Yep. 
watching, you know. I got a matched pair of Harris Hawks that live on the top of my tower. Do you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. I got a couple shots from the contest. Uh, you could, uh, if it was in the afternoon, you could often find beer bottles, uh, coffee, uh, mugs in the morning. Um, and then there's a short phase here where we were off the air again. Um, there was a lot of construction going on. Uh, Lynn Miller was instrumental in, because he knew how to build wood stuff. Well, he knew how to build lots of stuff, really. You know, he grew up on a farm after all. But uh, we worked on the house, we worked on my barn, we worked on the ham shack, we added to the ham shack used the current ham shack, which is separate from the house was used to be a, a walk in apple cooler. And uh, once we gave up the orchard, uh, we decided to uh, add on and make that a ham shack move all the equipment out of out of the house because I needed that area for an office for my business anyway, so everything worked out but it there was no way we could really get on the air. I think uh, there were in 90 or 2001, they might have made a few contacts in a couple of contests, but um, uh, in 2002, Bob called me. He was getting ready to move to Arizona, and we did a little uh, talking about doing one last blast here. Although I really didn't know it was going to be the last contest for nine years, but or 18 years, whatever it was. But um, so we got a uh, a multi two effort together, and by then the Rhone eighty tower was up, and um, the equipment had all been moved over to the ham shack. Most of the other antennas were the same, although the stacks had grown from um, two to three beams. You can't see the lower ones in this picture. This is an interesting shot here because when we moved in here, there was no subdivision on the north side of the road. Well, they built a subdivision in the 70s. And uh, as we were putting antennas up, I kept noticing every time I drove through this sub how obnoxious these towers looked. I mean, they look beautiful to me, but for people that wanted to live in that sub, it must have been a sight. And, uh, and realtors would call me sometimes and say, what the hell is that? My potential home buyer is a little worried about it. And I try to set them at ease all the time. <laughs> <laughs> this is a shot of shortly after that, right from the road in front of our house. So this was kind of, it's nice. this is actually about the way it is now, really. Um, that tower, this tower had grown up to 220 feet from 190, but I stripped all the wires off. There's no wires on this right now. It's waiting for a redo on, on 80 and 160. Uh, the three element 40, the, there's the three high stack on 20, five high stack on 10. This tower here, I don't know what to do with it. I, I, somebody gave me this 50 foot Roan SSV tower and I can't figure out what to do with it. And then this uh, is the three high stack on 15. And so that's uh, real close to what it is now. They're, although on 20, these bottom two antennas are down. The tick rings are down. I gave up on tick rings. They're a piece of shit as far as I'm concerned. And uh, there's, a, there's a gin pole up here waiting to take this antenna down. And you a day, huh? Yes. Can we edit the word shit out of the uh, recording? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> you're, you're well, I guess we'll have to edit it twice now. Oh boy, I didn't. Know. <laughs> Steve, <laughs> Steve, did you have the one motor or the two motor ticker? I don't think it's going to be a problem. Just, just the one. Oh, no, okay. just kidding. The motors weren't the problem, though. There was uh, eccentric, eccentric um, ring gears. Okay. Yeah, they, you'd get to one spot and the radius from the center of the ring gear, the, the imaginary center would like change about somewhere between a quarter inch and a half inch. And so the motor would be too tight in that gear and then all of a sudden it wouldn't be meshed at all. Okay. That was on both of those ring motors. Now I'll have to say, uh, whatever his name is over there at Tick, um, forget his name. 
he was he was willing to recut those gears at a real good price. He wasn't willing to do it for free, but I think he was going to charge me 125 a piece to recut them. But by then I had made other plans. I decided I didn't need that. The plan now is to have these two low antennas fixed on Europe. This was one of Lee's ideas. Uh, have this top rotary. They're, they're all going to be five elements. The bottom two are going to be treated as one antenna in the in the three high stack. And then the low antenna, when you switch to the low antenna, will be switched to the four element that's on an 80-foot tower way in the back of the lot back there. Uh, and that one is the one I'm using right now, which works fantastic. Well, yeah. Wow. Yeah, nice. This is a close-up of uh, one of the 10-meter pairs, uh, just to give you an idea. That's been up there forever. There's another one just like, I can't remember if this is the low one or the T t top one, but there's two pairs of these, and each pair is treated as a single antenna in the three high stack. And then there's um, this single antenna that's treated as the top antenna. At one time, I was going to put another pair up here at the top, just like I've got here and there, but 10's um, been so uh, not shitty, but um, bad uh, that I haven't worried about it for now. Uh, let's see. Oh, here's a nice shot. It's from three miles away. Uh, handheld telephoto. Um, kind of a nice sky at the time, but you could, this, um, this is the cell tower that Verizon went on when my deal with them fell through. They were supposed to be at the 160 foot level on this Rhone 80, but, uh, West Bloomfield put the kibosh on that. So they went over here. But um, they'll, uh, West Bloomfield will forever live in infamy in my mind over that incident. Here's some operating uh, shots from the 2002, which was our last big multi-operator uh, contest. If you look through this doorway here, that's the add-on. This The operating room is in the old cooler. You could turn that temperature down to uh, 20 degrees and the whole room would be 20 degrees. It's, it's got real good insulation in the walls and, and the uh, ceiling. But we added three rooms on the east side of the house. There's a kitchen, there's a bathroom with a shower and a little bunk room back there. And um, oh, there's um, Eric and Lee having fun, I'm sure. Amp room, amp room. Yes. Whoa. Three element uh, beam with ice. Yikes. Never like to see that, nope. but uh, it's been through it a few times and uh, it's survived. Is it? Uh, yeah, here's a little blurb, uh, another excuse page. I think I might have a few more photos. Oh, and I've got a little video clip that you might find interesting. It's from when Channel 4 um, visited one of our contests over on Halstead there. Um, oh, here's a couple pictures of what I did when I buried the cables, the new feed lines. They had all been running overhead on, um, on a suspension cable. And I've been wanting to uh, bury them, and I had all this inch and five eighths coax. So my guys and I spent a couple of days and buried it all. I found this box at, on a cell site, so the, the the big lines from the towers come up into the box, and then seven eighths cables go up into the ham shack and into the amp room at the other end. Um, there's the uh, smooth wall inch and five eighths cables coming up from the towers and they're just direct buried, uh, but I've got conduits for all the control lines so I can pull new cables if I want, pull the old ones out, whatever. Um, and then on this side of the cabinet is where all the control lines come in and I can interface to the rotators and uh, switch boxes. Um, and that's the front of the ham shack, uh, the current ham shack. Let's see what I got. Oh, 
And I got to show you some tall weeds because they haven't been cut in a, in a while. I have been a little too busy this year, but I wanted to show you the base of the towers, 10 meter base. Each of the three high band towers are pretty much the same. You got two, uh, two feed lines coming from the ham shack. One is a spare. Uh, there's a relay box, the stack switch that are vacuum relays. They're Kilovac HC1s, best relay to use. Used to be able to buy them for 20 bucks. Now they're about 60 a piece. We need eight in each one of our boxes to do the three high switching. And then each of those high band towers has another cable that goes from here to the 80 foot tower in the back. I put that in not only because I had enough cable to do it, but I, I thought maybe someday that we'd want a fixed 10 meter antenna on that tower back there. So I wanted a way to hook in from this relay box here to go there. Same thing on 15, same relay setup. Uh, one spare cable from the ham shack, one cable going to the uh, 80 foot tower and then the all the control cables come in this conduit. This, I told you that these feed lines are direct buried and they are, but the six inch piece of conduit just goes into the ground just to protect the cables at the ground level so I don't nick them with the mower and stuff. That's why I didn't do anything to seal them at the top because the rain just goes down there and soaks into the ground, you know. <laughs> There's the 20 meter one, worst one for weeds at the at the moment, but um, there's the uh, there's actually three inch and five eighths that come up here, and this jumper just jumpers me back to that four element back on the eighty foot tower. Uh, the relay box is in the shack right now. I gotta bring it out there and hook it up. Uh, that's the forty meter tower. Same deal. One spare cable from the shack. I didn't provide any way to get from here to the 80 foot tower. I didn't think the 80 foot tower would ever have a 40 meter antenna on it. Um, and then a blurb here about what I think we're going to be doing. Greg is helping me out with those 20s. Oh, I'm installing a DX engineering eight circle array. It's almost done right now. I'm really excited about trying it out. I had seven of the eight antennas in for quite a while and I couldn't get the eighth one in. I, I had a, I've got a rotary hammer with a, uh, a ground rod bit on it and I kept hitting this big block of wood someplace. But the thing was I didn't want to move over too far because I had so carefully measured this eight circle array to be within an inch of where all the elements were going and I didn't want to have to move over a foot. I finally dug down there and found this thing. It's a, uh, looks like a big old beam that somebody buried. I have no idea why, but I found that if I moved in a certain direction over three inches, I could get off of it. And uh, then the ground rod went in easy. So I'll have that running soon. I just can't wait to hear how it sounds. And that's about it. Oh, I just copied a couple. I copied off of the CQ website, the history of us in the CQCW. Uh, it's nothing like you'd see from W3LPL's setup. I think they've been in this contest for 40 straight years or something, but we did okay in a few of them. In fact, uh, there's, we got two plaques from this contest, and I'm a little embarrassed about both of them, although we turned in a pretty good score. I think it was this one in 80, but um, the top scorer had almost double our score, but they had won it the year before at the time CQ, um, didn't let you win two years in a row. So we got the plaque, even though we didn't win the contest. So, uh, but it was fun. And the same thing happened in the phone weekend. I think we won the plaque in this 1981 too. Same deal. And uh, ARRL doesn't have anything like CQ does, but today I just tabulated the four contests in the ARRL that we did fairly well from here. Uh, I think they were all multi-twos. This was the one uh, in 2002 where uh, we did pretty well. Yeah. What place did we come in, Bob? It fifth or something? Fifth, something like that. Yeah. yeah. And that's it. Now let me just quickly play this video. You guys will probably get a charge out of it. 
Um, if you didn't see it on TV back then, let me see if I can find Straight it. Straight up, I got a pee. <laughs> no time for that. <laughs> you're, not, <laughs> you're not drinking beer, are you? No, I just finished drinking some tea, and that's... Uh, oh. Okay, this is this is this is only three and a half minutes long. All right, I can hang on for three minutes. Wait a minute, now. I, I, long time. I got if a you were a true contester, you'd have your piss pot <laughs> right next to you. That's right. <laughs> Absolutely. I wasn't eighty years old when I was contesting. Oh god. Okay, can you see this? Yes. yes. This picture. Yes. Okay. Yeah. He just handed his head for. Can you hear me too? I can hear yeah. you. He he Here just handed. Kevin just handed the headphones over to Roger Weber from Channel 4. You'll see Roger a little bit later. He wanted Roger to hear a contact. So why did they come out to do the piece? I don't know. I think Jim Heber turned, turned Roger Weber on to us. Huh. It, when was this? This is okay. why you have television interference, people. <laughs> That's Pat calling CQ. Oh, nice QSLs. Al sleeping. It's Al, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For some reason, Roger was very interested <laughs> in <Yeah>. Al. <laughs> Sure, that was out. Are we supposed to be hearing this? Oh, you can't hear it? No, no, no. No, we only hear you. Oh, yes. shit. No. Oh, that's enough. I'm going to more edits. <laughs> I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, what do I got to do here? Um, let me just go back to the spot. <laughs> I guess to you, to put it bluntly, what's the point in all this? Well, the point is to contact as many foreign hams as possible during the 48-hour period. Um, it's a little bit of an ego trip, mainly. Uh, it's uh, just to see who has the best station and who's the best operators. This is pretty demanding. I, uh, so somebody sacked out in the living room. You're, you're up around the clock. Tell us a little bit more about the specifics. What you have to do, what your goal is, and how you're judged. The, uh, all the hams in the world uh, keep a, a record of who they contact. And at the end of the weekend, they send the logs into the American Radio Relay League in uh, Connecticut which is the sponsoring organization for this particular contest. Uh, about seven or eight months from now, all the results in tabulated form, according to everyone's classification, uh, will appear in the magazine. And it will be read by hams all over the world. And people will either uh, uh, be congratulated, or they'll hide their heads in shame. Or <laughs> and the first prize is $250,000, right? No, first prize is a, a certificate. No money? A piece of wallpaper. <laughs> <laughs> well, why is it worth all the trouble for a piece of wallpaper? Well, uh, just the satisfaction of knowing that you've put together, you've done a difficult thing. Okay, it's uh, it's difficult to win this contest. Okay. So after all the call letters are logged, they're transferred to this cross-reference sheet. They have already contacted stations in about 150 countries, places you'd never imagine, including station HV3SJ. That comes from the Vatican. Now, who could that be? And after all the hours and hours of work, what happens if these gentlemen are victorious in this unusual competition? Well, they don't win any money, they don't win any prizes, they only get a certificate that says they're number one, and they get the respect of their fellow hams. And for them, that seems to be good enough. Roger Weber, News 4 Detroit. That was cool. Yeah, that was Not cool. done yet. He kept, he tried this about five times. And after all times. the days and days of work in this incredible competition, what happens if the gentlemen inside this house are victorious? Well, they don't win any money, they don't win any prizes. All they get is a certificate that says they're number one and they get the respect of their fellow hams. And for them, that seems to be good enough. Roger Weber, News 4 Detroit. God damn it, I did. <laughs>
<laughs> Seemed fine to me. Yeah, yeah he, uh, he did that about five times. I couldn't tell what he was doing wrong. It sounded fine to me, you know. Sounds good but, to me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that was, uh, I think it was Jim Hebert who worked, worked at four at the time. They were always looking for little personal interest stories, that type of thing, you know. But I really didn't want them to come because we were serious in that contest. Yeah. And yeah. I knew that it was going to disrupt us, but it, it wasn't that bad. So. Yeah. yeah, you probably lost like at least own. 10 contacts, if not maybe 100. <laughs> maybe 100, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, Steve, uh, that was really cool. I've got a couple of questions for you. Yes. Uh, I, you, I didn't hear you talk about lightning at all. Do you have any good lightning stories or words of wisdom about that? Well, yes. Um, in all the years... In all the years at all three locations, I think we I've only been hit by lightning twice and they were both at this location. I've never had any grounding. I mean, the towers are grounded with a ground wire, but nothing like what you hear people doing, which, you know, might've saved me a couple of times. I think about 20 years ago, one of the towers got hit. I had to send one of the FT-1000s in uh, for repair and uh, uh, I think a couple computers got fried. And then about a year ago, I had just recently bought a new FT-5000, got hit again, Ooh. and the, uh, the, cat, the cat circuit on the transceiver was the only thing that went bad mm -hmm. on the FT-5000, but I did have to send it in. I, and I thought I might try to fix it, but the parts are so small in there on that, those surface mount mm -hmm. components. But in addition to that problem with the FT-5000, I lost gobs of stuff. Everything that was either connected to a USB cable, an HDMI cable, or a Cat5 Ethernet cable, like switches, Ethernet switches and stuff, everything was wiped out. Yeah, so that was... So I recommend going through all the stuff with the grounding. I just haven't ever done it, you know? So <laughs> there you go. I admit it. Um, and did you did you build all the relay boxes and the control yeah, uh, apparatus? Yeah, Len Miller um, and I built the uh, the outdoor part of it, the one with the relay boxes, and um, Kate LV designed and built the control boxes, which were IC based uh, programmed uh, uh, logic chips in there. And uh, one of those got zapped too in that last lightning hit I was just telling you about. Is that still what you use, those con those control circuits? Well, when that one blew, I thought, well, I can just put the 10 meter one in there for the time being. But that started me thinking about long term what I was going to do for that. And I started investigating things. And I've got two two different devices in the shack right now. And I think I'm going to go with the Green Heron one. Where they have a thing called uh, Green Heron Everywhere. And it's a Wi-Fi based thing with um, eight output um, uh, control relay boxes and it'll control relay boxes uh, through Wi-Fi out on your towers, whatever. It's a pretty flexible setup, not too expensive. I also got one custom made for me by Low Band Systems, um, which kind of surprised the hell out of me. This guy is in Ukraine and uh, I forget his call sign, but, um, he saw my post on one of the reflectors and sent me an email asking uh, if one of his units would work. And I explained to him that what he had stock off the shelf wouldn't work because I wanted direct button access to any of the seven combinations. The way the other ones are on the market, you'll generally have three or four buttons there, one for each antenna, and you'll have to hold three buttons down if you want all three antennas. I wanted... <laughs> I, got, I had gotten spoiled by that single button system. So, but anyway, he designed a whole new box for me with eight buttons on it and all pro just a beautiful job. Charged me $200 for this wow, thing. Geez. And it cost me about 50 bucks for shipping from huh. Ukraine. You know, so I, I can recommend this low band systems guy uh, if you need something that he has. He builds high power, um, transmit bandpass filters, um, all kinds of relay boxes, and real nice guy, so. Very cool. 
Thank you. Yep. Other questions for Steve? <clears throat> Good. I've got one one last question. When you're operating the on uh, multiple bands all at the same time, what yep. can what? How did you uh, were were the antennas far enough apart? You didn't have an, uh, uh, you know interference problems between. Well, you always have you always have some interference, but um, we designed the antenna so that each band would be on one tower, so you get some separation right off the bat. We didn't have two bands running on one tower except for maybe 80 and 160. But um, we had bandpass filters. I should have pointed that out in one of the pictures. Len Miller built um, homemade three section filters built in three ga one gallon gas cans. Um, they were, I don't know where he got these, but they were like um, chrome plated or something. Hmm. Uh, and uh, he had them all soldered together and uh, so they worked really well. I don't know if they're quite as good as the uh, uh, W, I think it's W3 NJN filters, but uh, they were pretty- NQN. NQN. Yeah. Yeah, but they were pretty, pretty good. We didn't have a lot of trouble considering the fact that we were using FT1000s, which are known to be a hash producer. And as long as you stayed away from the second harmonic, you know, it wasn't too bad. Yeah. Do you have to use any stubs at all, Steve, or just the filters did it? Just the filters. I had tried stubs before. I remember. It didn't didn't seem to uh, they didn't seem to work that well. But in in the meantime, I've done some reading on that, especially from Canine YC. Yeah. yeah. And it's it's critical where you place those filters in the feed line, depending on how long your feed line is. Yeah. So if you get them in the right places, they can work real well. But I uh, I I prefer the brute brute force method without a lot of farting around. Farting is okay on this uh, yeah, channel. It's good. Is that it? <laughs> okay. I, I think farting is okay. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, Greg, should I turn the recording off then? Yeah, I think we're good with Q and A there. Boy, Steve, thank you very much. That was yes. Oh, thanks for asking me. And a lot of history, and even the uh, I see WA eight LYF shows up on the CQ scores. You've got a few scores from the seventies in there. Yes. Uh, yeah, that would have been LYF. Yeah, I think I got the two letter call in seventy five, probably. Seventy five. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Sure is nice to see you without hair. <laughs> oh, you know, I, geez, I forgot to put my baseball cap on. 